Welcome everyone online to um, the second in the integrated building design webinar series. Um, before I introduce our um, speakers today, I thought I would um, give you all who aren't maybe familiar with the uh, UCL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering a quick um, introduction. Um, we are celebrating this year 55 years of environmental design and engineering at the Bartlett. Um, and um, uh, next week we have a whole series of, of events uh, as part of that. Um, at the IEDE, we pursue a deeper understanding of the interactions between the built environment and human health, well-being, productivity, energy use, and climate change. It's a diverse and large group, 55, uh, excuse me, 56 academics or researchers, nine visiting academics, 52 doctoral researchers, uh, 150 MSc students and 180 MN students. So big group uh, with some uh, good creds uh, from 2013 to current RAE Center of Excellence in Sustainable Building Design. Uh, in 2020, third in the world for architecture and the built environment. Um, continuing with a, a long uh, history of uh, EPSRC platform grants and um, through to 2021, uh, REF 2014, 46% 20, of our research was rated um, uh, fourth uh, world leading. We have uh, a number of different MSCs or MN, MSC in environmental design and engineering, an interdisciplinary and holistic approach to energy and carbon efficient building design. MSC in light and lighting is creative and technical advanced lighting design and controls. MSC in health, well being, sustain and sustainable buildings is that design and management for health and well-being uh, building and city scales. The MSc in smart buildings and digital engineering uh, looks at building systems, engineering and integration. The MEng in, uh, in uh, engineering and architectural design is relatively new, a four-year undergraduate degree, uh, integrates architectural, environmental and structural design into um, three uh, accredited um, um, degree, uh, three discipline degree program. So hopefully you get a little taste of, uh, of what we do here. And, um, and then just to tell you a little bit about our speakers, um, we have um, Steve Taylor, uh, who is an associate director at Alfred Hall uh, Monaghan and Morris or AHMM. Stephen joined the practice in 2001, uh, becoming an associate director in 2005. He's been responsible for a number of high profile projects, as well as for setting up and managing the Bristol office. Stephen has developed a specific expertise in commercial led mixed use developments and master plan, working for key clients and securing challenging planning permissions. Completed projects, including the innovative white collar factory about which we'll, he'll be speaking today, the Johnson building campus, the Stewart building, two new Bailey Square and Riverside house. Stephen is currently directing the design of mixed use developments at Assembly Bristol and Bath Keys North. Outside of the practice, Stephen has been invited to talk at many industry events, uh, events whilst also acting as REBA student mentor at Bath University and providing lectures in professional practice at UWE. Uh, joining Steve with us today is Craig Robertson, who is associate and head of sustainability. Uh, Craig joined AHMM in 2014 and is an architect, researcher, and teacher with expertise in environmental design and engineering. Prior to joining AHMM, Craig led architectural projects in the education, commercial, and housing sectors before moving into academia. He completed his PhD at the UCL Energy Institute, a good friend of ours, uh, focusing on the potential for energy consumption information to inform and justify strategic and detailed building design decisions. Craig is responsible for AHMM's sustainability agenda and leads the building performance team, which supports designers with performance analysis, environmental input, post-occupancy evaluation and research. Craig's current research focuses on the research, excuse me, on the relationships between architecture, performance, place and investment. He recently led an Innovate UK funded project focusing on information sharing for performance based design. He's an invited environmental design tutor at the Bartlett, lectures in sustainable design, and sits on the London Borough of Haringey's quality review panel. He became head of sustainability in 2016 and has made, was made an associate in 2018. 
and we hope uh, you will in, enjoy uh, the speaker's presentation today. If you have any questions um, that come up, and we hope you do, uh, please use the Q&A function, uh, which uh, pops up on the lower part of the Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to post your questions along the way, and then at the end, uh, we will uh, be uh, looking through those and, and asking as many of them as we can before the end. So, uh, oh, and just a reminder, uh, this is being recorded um, and will, um, with all the permissions appropriate, uh, be posted uh, later um, uh, for your review. So without further ado, uh, please, uh, I'll stop sharing and, and Craig. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, hope you are all well. Uh, as Elizabeth said, thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Head of Sustainability at AHMM. I'm joined by Steve Taylor, who's our Associate Director here. Uh, and we're going to give you a, a, a run through kind of integrated building design from an AHMM point of view. Uh, I'm going to give a, a, a very brief background into the kind of current industry uh, response to the need for integrated design, how we are approaching that as a profession, as architects, uh, and how at AHMM we are approaching that. Uh, as a team and how we're interacting with our, our wider design team collaborators. And then I'm going to pass over to Steve, who's going to give um, a, a talk through the White Collar Factory as, a, as one of HMM's um, recent examples of a, of a truly collaborative um, building uh, design and delivery. Um, so I wanted to start by kind of broadening uh, this out to uh, the kind of global situation, as we all know, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean to kind of teach us all to suck eggs here, but the, I think it's always worth touching on this in the context of integrated building design in particular, but buildings generally. The IPCC's Global Warming Report in, in 2018 showed the trajectory that we are on uh, as, a, as a species. We are running along a pathway which is going to push us well beyond the 1.5 uh, degrees upper limit of uh, what's deemed to be kind of relatively manageable global warming uh, within the next decade or so. So we're currently at 2020, we're about one, just above one degrees uh, above mean historic temperatures and we're, we're, we're on track to blast through that 1.5 degree upper limit very soon. Um, the IPCC also have plotted some trajectories um, to mitigate or, or limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. And this chart shows uh, from 1960 on to the end of this century. I don't know if you can see my cursor, I hope you can. Uh, and global mean temperature changes up the y-axis and it shows a number of, a number of um, scenarios in which we might um, halt uh, global warming uh, at 1.5 degrees and hopefully stabilize temperatures throughout the rest of the century. I want to draw your attention to this chart at the bottom left here. In order to achieve that stabilization of temperatures in the next couple of decades, uh, our global net CO2 emissions have to drop off a cliff. And I think, I mean, so catastrophizing around climate change is criticized, but there's no kind of nice way of saying this. Our global mean CO2 emissions have been rising year on year since uh, for the last kind of century and a half or so. And in the next three decades, they have to drop off a cliff. Um, and the IPCC, to hammer that home, say that we need rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of, of society. Um, so we are building designers collectively. We define society, we define the spaces in which uh, society happens, our lives happen. So I think we're, we're right at the center of, of making this happen. The UN Emissions Gap Report, um, touched on uh, the places where we need to do better to limit our emissions, to limit that global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they pointed out that uh, of the 50 odd gigatons of CO2 emitted annually, 20% of them come from material manufacturing, construction, extract of raw resources. And I want to just highlight these two charts because as we see from that, that, that 11.5 gigatons of CO2 emitted annually globally, the materials that are, that are causing that are essentially, a, oops, I've gone too far, sorry, are essentially a recipe card for a building. We've got plastic, wood, cement, metal, aluminium, iron and steel. This is the stuff we're specifying as building designers that, that, that make up our buildings. And the right hand chart shows that half of that stuff then ends up in construction. So again, the decisions we're making as designers, as architects, as engineers, the stuff we specify to make our buildings are having profound effects on our ability to, to limit uh, warming to 1.5 degrees. Uh, similarly, in operational emissions, this is a chart from SIBSI from 2012. Um, 
the data is from 2005. I've deliberately not updated it because actually, because despite uh, attempts to kind of change this dynamic, the, the numbers are broadly the same. But what it shows is that nearly half of all CO2 emitted in the, build, in, in the UK annually comes from buildings, domestic buildings, commercial buildings, industrial buildings. So 46% of operational CO2 emissions in the UK come from buildings. The other half are industrial processes, which as we've just seen, a lot of that is making things to make buildings out of. And the other portion is transport, which is generally transporting stuff between buildings. So again, in embodied emissions and operational emissions as an industry, as, as a collection of pr professions, as collaborators, we're, we're absolutely at the heart of uh, our efforts to uh, reduce emissions. Response then as a, an industry and as uh, professionals should be better than this guy's, rather than just pretending that nothing is happening. We have been working hard to put together a suite, a suite of guidance, documents, uh, ambitions and targets to help us deliver net zero carbon in buildings. That includes the, the Architects Declare, HMM were a founder signatory of that. The RBA have published uh, 2030 targets, which give us ambitious targets for operational uh, energy and, and embodied carbon. The plan of work seeks to build those up ambitions into our processes and our design pathways as uh, and our collaborators, collaboration frameworks that we work together on. And Letty, have uh, recently published their climate emergency design guide, which uh, gives very detailed guidance. Some of these things, some of uh, you, you listening may well have been involved in making, uh, uh, all of which are, are great. Um, the, the, the plan of work overlay of the RBA looks at setting goals and, and targets for eight different sustainability outcomes and tracking those um, goals and ambitions through the design process right through to the delivery of the buildings. And I wanted to show this slide because if we look at the outcomes, operation energy, embodied carbon, water cycle, transport, ecology, well-being, social value, life cycle, they're all the things that Elizabeth just outlined in all the different uh, um, courses that the Bartley offers. But these are, these are a really complex set of overla overlapping metrics and targets and aspects of building design that we can't do on our own. It requires proper integrated systematic, systematic holistic thinking that requires specialist input from lots of different people. So the collaborative integrated aspects of this design process should not be underestimated. At AHMM, we've taken a long-term view of 12 aspects rather than eight, but it's still the same thing. We require specialist input from lots of different people. Uh, we use a sustainability toolkit to measure our, our um, aspirations. We do that throughout our, our project processes by creating the sustainability pack, which takes into account life cycle analysis, embodied carbon, operational carbon, and all these other aspects in collaboration with all of our design team and project team um, consultants and collaborators. That also includes us at HMM doing lots of building performance analysis at design stage to support our architects, to work with our, again, with our collaborators, uh, to really help integrate all of these uh, sustainability aspects into our developing design process, integrate it into the, the developing design, check it uh, throughout the design process, through our value engineering process, through a procurement process to make sure that we're delivering something that uh, ends up on site um, doing what we thought it would do and reducing CO2 emissions over the life cycle of the building. Um, I'm going to finish there. I wanted to give a very brief run through from global position right through to, to AHMM's position. Uh, Steve is now going to talk through the white collar factory as discussed. So I am going to try and uh, stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Craig. Hopefully that screen, give me a thumbs up, Craig, wherever you can see that. That's Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so just picking up on some of the points that, that Craig and Elizabeth have, have raised there, um, they're all pertinent to, to the project I'm about to take you through. This is a, a, a 10 year journey from concept through to prototype, through to construction, through to operation of the building, ongoing testing and monitoring of that building. Um, it was born out of a longer period of working with a key developer client of ours, a developer called Derwent London. Um, looking at a number of buildings which over the course of, I guess, the last 20, 25 years of working with this particular client on a repeat basis, of finding and reinventing buildings of, uh, from, from history. So on the slide you can see on the screen here on the left hand side is a building called Morelands, uh, where we actually occupy the top of that building, uh, originally a carpet um, 
uh, warehouse and sort of bonded store, uh, about 100 or so years old, little older maybe. Um, to the right of that is the T building that some of you might recognise, a behemoth of the building uh, built uh, by the Lipton Tea family for the uh, storing of tea and also randomly the smoking of bacon. Um, so you can imagine the state that building was in when we first found it with Derwent and developed it um, about uh, 18 years ago. Um, to the right of that is the Johnson building, which looks like a new building, but it's actually a new building and an, and an old building coming together around a new central courtyard, uh, one external and one internal. And to the right of that is the Angel building um, at the top of St. John Street and Pentonville Road at the Angel, which was a reinvention of a 1980s building, a retention of a concrete frame, saving that carbon, saving some of that transport that Craig talked about in and out of London, in purely in the sort of demolition and recreation of a frame, we kept the frame, uh, kept the cores, reclad it, extended it to help uh, win area to pay for it all. So that was at four buildings for the same clients over the last 20 years or so, uh, near about, about buildings that were never intended as places of current work. They were places of industry, places of work, of blue collar work. But they were never intended to have uh, people working behind PCs, architects, engineers, um, range of different occupiers. And yet each of them made perfect vessels for that change of use. So they were robust buildings constructed robustly in simple terms using structure, services and skin and nothing more. Uh, very efficient in cost and energy terms but ultimately robust to change. So these are buildings that can withstand change, can provide a legacy um, uh, uh, for the future. You know, so they, these have kind of 100 year plus life uh, span. So having converted and reinvented a lot of these buildings with the clients, um, around the start of uh, the previous recession, um, uh, 2007, um, the client came to us and said, you know, they had a lot of time, like a lot of developers and consultants indeed had a lot of time on our hands at that point. And they said, what is it about those buildings that made them so good at reinvention for modern places of work? And um, what are those characteristics? And more importantly, why is it that buildings built in the 21st century don't yet have those same characteristics and that, that robustness to change. What have we lost in that sort of transition? What, what should we learn from the past in order to move forward to the future? So that was a question. So the white collar factory concept started, as I said, about 10 years ago with that question. We developed that into a piece of research and picked up uh, some other architectural precedents along the way. So from left to right, we've got uh, Maison de People in Paris uh, by Jean Prouvé, really uh, son of a blacksmith, inventor of, of everything, including architecture, and the, and the sort of forefather uh, of curtain walling technology uh, on, the, on buildings, as you can see there. Um, Johnson Wax, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright, and the, the use of volume and, and light. Uh, and depth of floor plate for that building. Uh, reinvention of buildings like Van Nel um, factory in, in, uh, uh, in Holland. And then to the right, Albert um, Kahn. And uh, he, as an architect and engineer, creation of almost 2000 buildings for the Ford Motor Company uh, through the latter part of the last century. Buildings of utilitar utilitarian quality um, and substance and uh, of beauty as well. So it was a bit of research into the past, a bit of research into the work we'd done reinventing uh, these buildings of the last hundred years uh, with this client Derwent at London. And developing from that research a concept which was um, devoid of architecture, but actually starting to focus on what are the elements that actually enrich and inform that architecture. Let's allow the architecture to emerge from that process. So it's about understanding that those buildings and buildings of the future uh, for us should be dealing with generosity of volume and light, so tall ceilings, should look to be doing a lot more with a lot less. So it's about smart servicing. How can we use the course of structure um, and how can we make facades uh, respond to orientation? So uh, prevent the sun coming in where we don't want it. Um, if we let too much in, we're throwing kit at it to deal with a problem that was of our own making. So let's uh, use fabric first um, principles to design that requirement out. It's about deep plan for functionality and flexibility. 
although in a post-COVID world, we might be testing that again. That might become linear and finger-like rather than the sort of donut floor plan. And for us, it was about a concrete structure in a very, um, I guess, broad terms, a structure which is robust enough to deal with change, uh, whether it's environmental change, market and attitude change, or indeed use change within a building. It was a, it was a structure that's built to last. And of course, um, the cement replacement of that structure is really important to us. And we can maybe touch on that as we go through uh, the presentation. So it's a suite of ideas around a concept that we then engaged with our friends at Arup uh, as engineers, who then looked to, again, build on this question about how can we build better in the 21st century, coming out of the last recession and building through to where we are today. And it was a lot of analysis that they had gathered over their experience, working with us and Derwent London on, on the same projects and working out simple met metrics. So I won't bore you with, um, uh, with graphs because that's uh, Craig's uh, speciality. Um, but um, the one which I thought was really interesting coming out of this analysis was for less than 1% of the operational hours uh, spent for um, office workers within the building. So less than 1% of the annual working hours is when the temperature actually dips above uh projects above the bco standard for office uh, temperature and in that internal environment so for less than one percent we're actually providing air conditioning traditionally into those buildings uh based on you know for 99 percent uh of the time where you don't actually need it so it's a real sort of um i guess sort of um point in the concept and research work that you thought we should be doing a lot more here with a lot less um so that was some metrics which we developed with arup we then developed a benchmark building, again, which is devoid of architecture, devoid of site, but set a benchmark in this collaborative process for architecture, engineering, both structures and uh, servicing and environmental, but also crucially, um, uh, the cost consultancy as well. So cost and program brought into this as well, uh, because these, we're talking about commercial buildings, about viabilities, about developers that need to hit targets and that we have to work with them in their world in order to help influence um, some of the lessons learned from the past. So what we did here was to develop a, a concept, a baseline, as we called it, at £165 a square foot. These are sort of uh, the figures from back in the day, so don't read too much into that. But it's developing a baseline that can um, evolve as it needs to adapt to site and as it needs to adapt to markets. But once you get to the baseline, the most efficient that the building can be, every time you make a move away from that, you can understand the reasons why you can challenge yourselves on that, find comfort where you need to, and then move on to the next phase. So it's around really securing everything in the design um, iterate, iterative process against this baseline. So the baseline and the concept, a lot of which starts to come together in the uh, building section. So it was about um, a height for these floor plates, increasing that height is about using the structure uh, and to do more than one thing with, with the structure. So it's aesthetic, it's clearly doing the structural solution for the building, but it's also in a bit, has the ability to carry cool um, and sort of uh, cooling and heating for the building as well. So again, as I say earlier, doing a lot uh, more with a lot less. So we developed the concept into the section. We then took that research um, and built it into a prototype. So this was um, about a 3000 square foot prototype um, designed with us Arab uh, on the MEP and AKT2 as structural engineers. It was built on the site of the current building pre-demolition in an old car park built on stilts 10 meters in the air so we could get back up into the actual um, environment men, environmental conditions that the real building would would um, need to deal with um, we built it with the embedded pipework uh, in terms of its cooling and i'll talk about more detail of that in a, in a moment and it became fully operational so this was a, a 3,000 square foot of uh, the building representing our prototype and all that research coming together. It was operated for 12 months. It was monitored and analyzed by Arup and ourselves with Craig uh, during that period to prove to ourselves that the concept worked um, before we then could then take that to the market. So during that process, we engaged with the market, we engaged with bodies like the uh, British Council of Offices, to, to sort of work with them to understand their baseline and to look to challenge some of that as, as well and move forward. And in doing so, we found enough comfort in that process to um, then um, 
develop this scheme into its entirety on site. So really in the innovative process, um, a big risk for the client, for the developer client, for, to be building a uh, building of this scale at that time using technologies uh, which were for the first time probably coming together in, in this assembly um, for the first time in a market that was quite jittery and also a market which is um, can very easily revert to type, revert to a very uh, sort of inefficient baseline. Um, so it was a big risk for the client developing it. So the prototype, whilst it was money spent ultimately to be demolished to make way for the main building in the scheme of things was the right thing to do in this kind of 10 year journey for us. So this was the site as we discovered it on the corner of Old Street um, and, the, and the roundabout, some of you might recognize. And the first thing to do uh, was to bring our con concept, our ba benchmark concept and apply it to site. And of course that super efficient 45 meter square, water floor ratios are great, net to, net to gross ratios are great, but we don't build like that in cities. We have other influences that affect the architecture. So the site, the shape, the, the shape and proportion of that benchmark needed to adjust to suit the site. So every time you adjust that shape, um, if inefficiencies come in and cost starts to rise, you then need to take into account um, the effects of neighbours in terms of daylight and sunlight and other sort of neighbouring um, influences. And again, that affects shape. Uh, if inefficiencies come in and costs go up. And then you look to split core. So here, key move was to move the primary core to the south of the building to help with that solar uh, protection of the floor plates and still provide some flexibility for this floor in the market. And then above that, you build tools. So having one, having lost some efficiencies and lost area in the shaping of our baseline, you then have to win more area to help bring that efficiency back in. Of course, the higher you go with the building, the more lifts you need, the more service runs you, you're needing to do. So efficiencies are, are affected that way as well. So, so you're having to make all of these moves against this baseline in a design, uh, in an des iterative design process. Ultimately, it gets us to a shape and scale and massing on site, born out of our principles, born out of lessons learned from, from the mock-up and the prototype, um, and then applied to the site. And you can see there the sort of cost per square foot figures that we get to. So there's a move from that sort of sub 200 figure to plus 200 pound a square foot figure. And again, these would be tested again if we did it in the current market. Um, but we understood every reason behind the step, the, uh, each step of the way for, for why those moves were needed to, um, to, needed to take place. So as a result, we create a building which is in actual one building in a suite of buildings in its use piece of city. So um, I'll run through some of the functions in a, uh, through in a, now and then get back to the detail. So uh, the top of the building is a rooftop club, which is really about a room uh, enjoyed as a breakout and amenity for everyone in the buildings. There's uh, a 150 meter running track around the, the top of the building, which was really a net result of the uh, building maintenance unit, which is this uh, carriage that runs around the edge of tall buildings to drop people down to maintain facades. We always, you, you have this um, sort of three meter sort of track around the tops of buildings. We decided to then uh, utilize that as a running track. It's become somewhat of a sort of a cliche for the building. I, th I, I think um, it wasn't our original idea. It was a very much a, a sort of afterthought uh, making best use of that space. Below that, we have 15 floors of flexible workplace and a multiple uh, number of tenants within the building. We have a public coffee shop at the back of the building, um, so bringing the public through uh, into a commercial building, which is private, but is sort of secured, but is open to the public. Um, we have a courtyard, which is still publicly accessible and creates new routes through the city between the buildings. Uh, there's a vast site store uh, below some of those buildings with the, with the other facilities you'd expect. Um, and then uh, supplementary and um, complementary buildings uh, forming a courtyard to the south of White Collar Factory, which were new combination of new build and existing retained and reinvented buildings to provide uh, for startups and incubators for some of those biz businesses uh, in the Old Street um, um, area. And then uh, as part of mixed use policy in Islington, um, a degree of housing that came into the development as well. And I'll quickly flick through those last few slides. So in essence, it was for us about doing more with less, um, focusing on those three core subjects, core elements that 
every building needs. So it's about the, the structure, super, substructure and superstructure. It's about the servicing of that building. So it's about moving air around uh, and water, of course, and electric and data. And it's about the skin of the building. It's about the, the sort of, not just the architecture of it, but it's how that skin can work in collaboration with structure and, um, and the services in, in light of our concept. So we create the building as you see it here in the city. And then taking it back to the constituent parts so to start with structure. And these are a few slides that our friends at AKT2 have given us to demonstrate what ordinarily they would be they would be sort of specifying from the start. So steel frame buildings, buildings of height, lightweight steel, tall, uh, long spans um, and, and sort of a lot of it not necessarily very good for thermal mass, not very good for sort of running services through in the way that our concept um, was looking to do. So with AKT, we started looking at a lot of different um, options for the engineering to test all of those against the baseline um, concept and then through to the construction of the white collar factory. And hopefully uh, my narration is picking up with the slides here. Apologies for any delay, but um, next slide is showing um, the site in the demo, uh, demolished form with excavation taking place, um, a, a vehicular gyratory and an underground station to the north of the site. We instigated techniques of construction such as top-down construction where piles were driven through with, with a cluster above to take place while excavation could happen below simultaneously. So as you'd expect, a lot of propping, lots of shear props, uh, some sizable members there to um, maintain the basement. And a lot of which was done in a concept of, of a context rather of uh, um, underground tunnels, um, service tunnels, uh, sewers and the like, uh, as, as one would find underneath many of our sites in the city. Um, and it's the structure then having to deal with some of those conditions. So you can see the ground loading displacement conditions in this, um, in, in the sort of contours of, of this section, site section. Um, what that meant ultimately was a cantilevering of a structure adjacent to city road, away from some of those tunnels, which we then needed to monitor right the way through the works. And above which then meant that we had a, a structural frame which um, had a thermal mass to it being in concrete, had some quite large spans um, that you'd otherwise not want to be doing concrete, so spans of up to 10, ten and a half metres in a single span, three metre cantilevers um, in, in the concrete as well, using the back span to, to achieve that. Um, and of course, working with AKT, looking at the uh, deflection contours of those labs to make sure we can put the reinforcement in where we need it and dealing with this massive cantilever we had to do away from the um, the tunnels. So you, we ended up with a very simple structure having to do a lot of structural uh, gymnastics to do with site shape and ground conditions which concrete naturally uh, was better suited to do rather than rather than steel. So you had a flat slab dealing with that uh, span in both directions, dealing with some quite wide spans and some cantilevers, and then ultimately allowing as a speculative development, a number of occupiers to come onto the floor, whether it was um, heavy IT or um, a mix of uses for different tenancies. So a couple of other images here from the uh, Revit model, which was developed again, a sort of lesson in collaboration with our engineer, uh, engineer friends. So this gives you an indication of the amount of substructure needed to uh, cantilever the building away from the tunnels. The next slide gives you an indication of um, building at height with this idea of running cool water pipe work through the slabs. This was how we got the cooling into the building. So um, running cold water in, in continuous uh, um, uh, uh, plastic pipe work through the structure, which dealt with different um, uh, occupation zones around the building. So uh, more around the perimeter, less into the center of the building. But what this allowed us to do as a concept working with structure and services together was to say that the perimeter of the building for the first say six meter depth around the perimeter um, gave us the ability to provide natural ventilation from the facade into that um, perimeter. 
that natural ventilation is never going to provide enough air um, uh, changes per hour in the interior of that floor plate. So cooling and mechanical ventilation was always needed in that interior. But what it did mean was the option of having two zones, so better and an interior zone for our mechanical fresh air. Um, mechanical fresh air being supplied to the center, some to the perimeter, but with the ability for that to be turned off and to allow for natural ventilation to come into the um, first six meters of that floor plate. So what that allowed us to do was to achieve 25% reductions in operational energy uh, and carbon savings as well, something that the tenants can really benefit from. It gives the tenants that tangible ability to um, open a window and control their environment, that kind of placebo effect of feeling as if they are controlling the environment, the feeling of draft um, into, the, into the space. And it gives them the the um, gives us the ability to then give them that further control, so that when the, the outside air temperatures are within a range that um, the fresh air can come into the space and actually improve that internal environment, um, we use a traffic light system, which I'll, I'll show you in in, a, in a, the next few slides. Where if it's on a green day, it's saying to the tenants the air temperature on the outside is such that windows can be open because the mechanical ventilation around the perimeter is being turned off. On a red day, mechanical ventilation's on, so don't open the windows. You're losing energy at that point. So very sort of basic, um, uh, I, I guess, sort of analog ways of deal of, of engaging the, the building occupants with their building. So that building engagement with the occupants really important. Um, this is just a plan of, of that pipe work through the slabs, dealing with the different zonal qualities. So this is about facade and structure and services starting to work together. The, the facade here is saying that we're dealing with the solar orientation. So the blue ring around the building is this natural ventilation zone. We've got facades that need to be pretty closed on the south, the east and the west. So that's about a 30 percent glass. Um, the rest of it is solid um, towards the north where we don't have that same solar condition. We can then open the facade up. So we still need our insulation qualities in our fabric first um, sort of principles. But the facade then opens up to be about two thirds glass, one third solid. And in doing so, that gives us a natural architecture to the to the building, natural sort of variation to the facades. The facades then in, we then in, introduce the idea of uh, solid panels of insulation, glazing as as glazed elements, but also glazing behind um, panels as opening windows uh, with these perforated panels in front. So you are at height in this building; it's ground plus sixteen stories. You're one hundred meters above the ground. So the idea of being able to open a window with a grill that helps to diffuse some of that wind um, and provide that sense of protection is really important. And then the next slide is a, is a sort of uh, view of the sort of underside of a ceiling, a reflected ceiling plan, if you like, where structure services and the skin start to come together. And what that means is a lot of design collaboration up front, a lot of coordination um, through the early design phases before we get to construction, which is where Revit, uh, BIM and the use of Revit very much came in uh, into, its, so into its own, being able to co collaborate all of that, uh, coordinate all of that. But then also importantly, a collaboration with the, uh, with the uh, contractor, with Multiplex and their trade uh, contractors and supply chains to really understand how as a team we're going to put this building together. So you can see the amount of coordination that's needed. In, um, those. So just an indication how opening windows work, both at the top of the building where we have uh, port portholes and then the, the sort of vented panels on the lower floors. And this idea around exposing of structure. So we're not covering everything up. We're trying to do more with less. We're allowing structure finishing as well as structures does our, our sort of visual appearance and it also provides a kind of carrier for, for the cooling of the building um, and then using this very sort of simple idea of a traffic light system between a green and a red day for when people can and can't open windows and then i'll quickly take you through a sort of um a sort of visual journey through the building so a view of the white collar factory from old street roundabout you can see the facade here on the north facing aspects are uh, about two thirds glass, one third solid. You can see how the, the fenestration changes towards the top of the buildings. You can see how some of these cuts uh, to allow servicing to run vertically through the building as well, and to add some articulation to the architecture. The building narrows on its eastern flank against City Road um, and does this um, step and cantilever against the uh, um, underground tunnels. 
And then as we move around the building towards the south, you can see how the facade closes down. So this is one third, two thirds solid uh, with opening vents behind those perforated panels. And the perforated panels are very much a lesson learned from our, our sort of research into Jean Prouvé and a lot of his work uh, from, um, uh, from the, the latter half of last century. And as we move around into the context of uh, the, the surrounding context of our neighbours and looking at those existing buildings and how they come in to uh, link in with the wider estate of uh, smaller office buildings, housing with white collar factories sat behind. Those buildings coming together around a central courtyard piece. So people um, living and working and being entertained around this new um, courtyard, which is fully accessible to the public, this new public route through beneath which sits a 6,000 square foot, uh, square foot, six meter tall space below the courtyard. So this was a space which is kind of gifted to us by the site shape, a site shape at basement, which is filled with, with cycles and showers and back of house facilities, but then leaves the net result of a sort of 10,000 square foot space in the heart of the development, albeit beneath this courtyard. So it's this amazing room which we have most recently occupied ourselves. So we've taken sort of a lease on this space and created another uh, studio uh, for all the uh, men uh, from our Moorlands headquarters. So as you move through the building from the front entrance into the reception hall and this idea that um, doing a lot more with less, so services are left exposed, structures left exposed, the story of the building is left exposed to, to tell as we move through the space. And it's providing for a number of tenants. So we've got um, engineers in there, so AKT2 the building are now in their building. Uh, we have some co-working space, we've got a bank in there, we've got some lawyers in there, uh, we've got Adobe as their London headquarters in there and a number of other creative industries. So there's a range of different occupiers that are, are welcome to take this, you know, have really enjoyed taking space in the building from more institutional occupiers to more creative sectors. So as we, as we move through the building, everything starts to be exposed. Shuttle lifts from cycle stores to reception are, are, are sort of exposed and celebrated journey through the building so uh, structure is uh, is always left out on show so we're not covering anything up so the idea of the other follow-on and wet trades we've sort of removed from from the building so it's very much about doing more with less the idea ever uh, relevant now in a post-pandemic world about in inviting people to use staircases so rather than having stairs uh, tucked away behind cores out of sight we encourage people to use the stairs rather than the lifts. So from the lift lobby, where this photo is taken from, if, if you're waiting for a lift, you can see the stair, you're encouraged to use it. Obviously in the event of a fire, then fire doors, which are otherwise on hold opens, can then close to provide that protection. And of course, there are other stairs, the second stair on the outside of a building to the north, overlooking Old Street Roundabout. And again, the encouragement of that use to, um, for tenants to use between floors, and there's opportunities to break out as well. Um, we're onto a typical floor plate now. Uh, so this is pre-fit out, so it's a cat A environment. So structure, services and skin coming together here. So you can see how the concept's really starting to, to work here. So the concrete you see exposed is providing the cool for the building. So we're running cold water through those slabs. So these are kind of passive measures. Uh, the duct work in the two zones, one perimeter, one interior. Uh, the perimeter duct work turning itself off when external air temperatures allow to allow tenants to then open the window. So the glass uh, behind all these uh, circular grills, uh, the, 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 those are located every three meters. So even when you're cellularizing this building, you can still provide fresh air into every single office cell. Um, as you can see from the next slide, uh, following a fit out that we designed for uh, the office group who are a co-working uh, provider. As you can see from these slides and then moving through because I'm conscious of time, just illustrating some of the fit out, some of the other spaces towards the top of the building where we're creating double height spaces to make best use of some of those solar orientation and views across the city. 
and notwithstanding a lot of control that we have as architects and engineers coordination um, contractors can never resist uh, being a bit cheeky with the work uh, not quite realizing this is actually finished work uh, and, and sort of do, doodling all over it I think this was probably one of the, the, the sort of more um, polite uh, sort of doodles uh, we were able to show um, and then as you move through the building towards the top uh, coming up towards the running track on the roof 150 meter running track which is as I, as I say become a real sort of feature of the building uh, sort of unintended consequence from the start the idea of breakout at the top of the building so tenants can come in and use this space for external uh, breakout and internal breakout there's a cafe that the, that the building runs up there and again as a post-pandemic world the the ability to break out the ability to have space and volume and step away from work and potentially away from colleagues is is ultimately important so this building was very much on that direction of travel um, pre-pandemic and hopes hope to sort of continue influencing the work as we move on. So that's the view from the top of the building, at which point I'll um, leave you and I guess hold, uh, hand back to Elizabeth, who I believe is chairing any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um... That was great. We we do. Um, I had a, I had my own question just in case there was a delay, but uh, I guess I don't I don't get to answer, ask that just yet, um, uh, as we have some good ones. Uh, the, the first question was uh, it's from Owen Connick, and it's uh, prototype. Wow, uh, if you are doing this project, how would you still build? A, would you still build a physical prototype, or maybe look to use a digital twin instead? Yeah, that, that's a great question, actually. And I think it's um, the answer is probably um, we would use both. I think the 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 the, the latter, the sort of um, AI version of it wasn't necessarily available to us at the time, but it but probably is now. But I think the physical nature of the mock ups really important, the prototype. And I think for, for a client like this, we've, we've through all the buildings we've we've produced with them over the last sort of 20 years they've always been interested in that sort of tangible nature of architecture and construction um, and we've always built mock-ups with them usually about visual mock-ups about getting the detail right um, then that drifted and sort of grew into mock-ups for construction and how we can learn how to construct better at a small scale before going big scale so the prototype was a sort of the next in line of mock-ups that we developed continuously with this uh, with this particular developer and gave us the opportunity to test theory and research as well as construction as well as design and it was something pulled apart and changed you know we, the facade came on and off a number of times before we got it right in its functionality and its design and aesthetic and that allowed us to then build from a 3,000 square foot mock-up a quarter of a million square foot uh, sort of mock-up so there was great savings made on that on, on on the prototype before moving into the real thing but i mean these are all things that can be tested um i guess kind of artificially through computer software but it's this it's no substitute for that kind of physical thing that people can stand in and feel and be part of and actually work from we had people from arab um working in that prototype for a number of months in the summer through a heat wave to prove that the um that the, the um space worked craig was there anything you wanted to add no, I won't. You, you you touched on and you talked on uh, hello Owen. I hope you're well. Um, the you touched on the the financing of this and what I got from that prototype. The really important aspect of this was being able to put agents who are ultimately going to sell this building into that space so they could experience what it was going to be like. Because whilst the the market has sort of um, ate the white collar factory a bit, it, it's, it's it's easy to forget quite how radical that proposition was in 2008 2009 when, 2011 when we, were, when we were developing it um so actually being able to put agents who are going to sell the building and release that financing put the bco inside there to show that we're still meeting their criteria and how the building is going to feel like um is really important and really um crucial part of actually selling the idea being able to experience it i wonder yeah so we it's a good question because we've developed vr capabilities now where you can put people in those spaces but yeah I, I i i agree that um actually the physical thing of being able to put people in that space is, is really important yeah i think it's interesting craig because i think the the industry sadly moves quite slowly to change in <clears> change <throat> of attitude in particularly in these commercial speculative markets so the ability to put agents in there to prove that it worked was was vital and also the bco who is uh, an organization we respect and challenge in equal measure and actually we challenged a lot of their baseline 
and their benchmark in the guide um, was was sort of uh, created originally with very best intentions, but then ultimately watered down through markets uh, to a kind of vanilla that was used as a kind of to test every potential mm. office speculative building against and it kind of lost its way so we presented the building to the bco it was sort of a very nervous uh, client when we presented to the bco because we had sort of we knew we didn't comply with a lot of what their code needed and that mean translates to the market being quite nervous about taking on something that they might perceive, perceive as innovative and yet the bco's response was incredible i mean they, they sort of said well this is actually what the guide was intended it was a baseline to be challenged to find alternatives creatively and innovatively around and this is what you're trying to do we need to do be doing more of this so i think working with the bco very early on getting them in the mock-up sort of paid dividends as we pushed on because we're challenging things with them about rather than measuring temperature in spaces, we should be measuring comfort because that's how people experience the space. It's not about temperature, 23 degrees plus or minus two, it's how they feel in the space is what's important and how they engage with their environment. And yeah, as I say, prototype worked brilliantly at uh, demonstrating that. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good lesson that it's, um, it's how people feel. It's, that is ultimately what we're interested in. So yeah. I think it's a, a good way to demonstrate that with a physical uh, prototype. Um, oh, Owen has another question. It's, uh, there's a couple of questions actually, one from Owen, one from Alan West, uh, both are about, uh, about the slabs. Um, Owen's is, did you look at a comparison between casting floor slabs in C2 versus precast, um, noting that inlaid pipe work, pipe work um, are precast slabs available with pipe work already incorporated? That yeah, so we, we looked at a lot of those options. Um, the precast was difficult for us because of the shape of the site. So there was very little repetition in it. There's a lot of sort of perimeter uh, uh, bespoke units that would have been needed, but that was certainly something working very early with the contractor and his supply chain uh, that, that we sort of tested, as did we test um, post-tensioning of a slab to, in order to thin it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was, I think, available to us. The engineers were keen to do it because they're wanting to challenge themselves. But I think there was nervousness in the market and the supply chain to actually push that through. Um, but nevertheless, we we took got the slab down to be as thin as possible. It was in situ, which allowed us to lay the pipework in. Uh, we used 50% uh, cement replacement, which is pretty high at the mo at that time. Although I think we can push that even more now. And actually, what I, what I, sh I didn't say in the talk was AKT having designed the building uh, structure and now taken three floors in, 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 the, in the building and now monitoring the structure themselves. So they've, they've got um, deflection and movement monitors on their floor plates. So some of their own industry standards that say you must design and detail the um, reinforcement for these slabs to deal with these sort of loading and deflections, plus a bit more, plus a little bit more, they're actually using their own data to challenge some of those. Because if they can challenge some of those base mark, baselines, they can reduce slabs further and increase spans. Um, it's set against very real data that they've gathered themselves. So I think that's a sort of um, really good lesson that they've learned from the process. And I think even moving forward, we've test taken what we've learned from the white collar experience, into other projects where we think, well, actually, how can we do this with lighter weight construction, whether we're using steel, whether we're using CLT or hybrids of those systems as well. So this was a real, uh, uh, I guess, Craig, springboard for us, wasn't it, in terms of testing other other sort of um, uh, uh, sort of hybrids for, for future buildings? Yeah. Yeah, we're working on a number of different hybrids where we can test those ideas and uh, build in adaptability and, and greater adaptability as, as well, yeah. So have you, this is, uh, nobody's quite, this is my question. Um, do, so have you ha uh, had an opportunity to, to um, work with CLT at this point? With, or is that just in the dreams? No, no. So we've, we've delivered, uh, we've, we've built a residential CLT building. Um, we've got a number of offices uh, on the boards at the moment. Uh, a couple have got planning permission. Uh, all hybrids. So we've got a steel frame with um, CLT slabs. Uh, on the go, we have a concrete and CLT hybrids, which is really exciting because it does a lot of the things that the white collar factory does. But the CLT, depending on if, if you take into account sequestration of carbon in that CLT or not, it, it gives some very good uh, embodied carbon savings. But it also allows for really relatively easy adaptation, opening up holes in the in these deep plans, as Steve mentioned in his talk. Um, 
you know, in a post-COVID world, we might end up with finger buildings or certainly more atria to get more air through it. Um, but it just adds that much, much greater flexibility. And, and what's exciting for me is a kind of re-optimization of the building for future climate and future functional requirements or market requirements or whatever. So it's really exciting, the hybrid stuff we're working on. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, um, I'm from the West Coast, uh, North America, and we're big on lumber over there. So uh, we've been in Vancouver, they've been pushing BLTs. Mm. Fun to see it um, uh, broadening uh, its, its uh, impact. Uh, so Alan's question uh, also about the slabs, uh, was there any anxiety from the developer with the use of embedded cooling, uh, expectations of tenants in terms of subdivision and flexibility, um, and how was that managed? Um, yes, good, good question. I think there were, uh, there was nervousness, um, might not be what you mean by your question, but uh, there was nervousness from the contractor in terms of construction of, of pipe work in concrete, um, and people putting drills through them, uh, which was sort of a very real issue, uh, which was very simply sort of dealt with by the contractor, um, creating their own drill bits, which are only so long. Uh, that was never near, you know, went into the concrete cover before you hit any pipe work and then free issuing all of those to every trade on site um, through the sort of toolbox talk. So they dealt with that in that instance. But what we also did in kind of to future proof the building for tenants was to allow uh, plugins in the slab as well. So um, if someone was to partition into the space and create smaller um, sort of condensed um, environments within the floor plate, they had the ability to take water out of a slab through a plug on the ceiling and bring it into a um, kind of like a radiator panel in reverse, so a kind of cool as a panel brought into a meeting room or, a, or a sort of individual office. So you, so that would really be just taking the same water out of a slab into a into another unit within that space. Um, and some of the tenants have looked to, to, to do that as, as well. So that kind of helped to future proof the, the building. Interesting, great. And let's see, I think we've got time for at least, at least one more, uh, maybe a couple more. Um, was there any discussion with the client about reducing floor ceiling height in order to maybe squeeze in another floor mm -hmm. or two? Um, uh, was the option explored and how did you justify retaining that uh, clear, that three and a half meters? Yeah, the three and a half meters. Yeah, I mean, it's um, luckily for us, we're dealing with a with a uh, developer client here who, well, they, I should have said at the start, Derwent London are, are a REIT, so they're a real investment uh, trust um, uh, uh, they, they keep hold of their buildings so for them they can take a long-term view they don't build to then flip on and sell so they want to work their tenants learn from their tenants and, and learn how to get the next make the next next building ever better um, so so they were very much in tune you know they asked the original question they drove us into the research and the prototype and ultimately the building so the idea of floor four meters floor to floor three and a half meters floor to ceiling was something they very much bought into from the start inevitably along the way you have to challenge yourselves to make sure that's still the right decision um and for the overall height of the building we could have probably squeezed in another two maybe three floors of traditional institutional floor to ceiling heights uh, so we did challenge that but the client very quickly sort of said well i'd rather have less floor area of, of better quality and character which deals with all the issues we're trying to deal with from our original question and the concept rather than more floor space of lesser quality um, and i think in actual fact he could probably have built built more floor levels than we actually did within the planning consent we could probably have gone slightly taller but i think building quarter of a million square feet of an innovative system was kind of enough in the speculative market so it was a massive gamble uh, for the client that ultimately has paid off to to make this building one of I think one of their most profitable commercial ventures um, from what they've said in terms of the original valuation of the building from drawing stage to where it is now in the market is going sort to of surpass their their sort of um, their expectations so I think there is something there about sort of keeping the faith and and um, keep being true to the concept but we were challenged on it I mean inevitably yeah Okay, I'm going to see if you can answer this really quickly. Um, somebody knew they've got a couple other questions which we'll um, capture and then we'll, we'll see if we can answer it later off, offline. But uh, the, the David uh, True says the factory is located in a noisy part of London. Was traffic noise a concern with the natural ventilation option? Um, 
Uh, yes, it was. We did a lot of testing in the Arab Sound Lab to um, sort of artificially to, 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 to test and create that and, and establish that above level three or four, you could open a window and, and still be able to work within that environment. Background noise, uh, sort of white noise actually improves an office working environment. Yes, the lower floors, levels one, two and three are challenged against the roundabout, but on the other side of the building has the, the courtyard to open onto. But we still provided opening windows there to try and future proof the building. So as we move towards um, sort of decarbonizing the grid and our, our sort of transport systems, one would hope that noise and pollution starts to starts to drop and allow that to happen. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both. And, and uh, thanks everybody for, for listening uh, today. Um, really appreciate uh, your time and, and attention. Great, great, uh, great work. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.